So I noticed that on YouTube, there aren't a lot of videos on the CELO theorems, and in particular, how to get an intuitive feeling for how the proofs of the CELO theorems work, and why they work, and what they're important for. So I wanted to make a sequence of videos that goes over the proofs of the theorems, together with a video or two on examples of using them. So as a disclaimer, this material requires quite a bit of background. So you have to have familiarity with groups, orbits, stabilizers, subgroups, pretty much a lot of the material that happens, particularly in the group theory section. So this video is gonna be dedicated to part one of the CELO theorem. And let's look at the setup to see what we're trying to prove. So you're given a group G that has size P to the K times M, where P is a prime and P and M have no common factors. So another way to word this is that P to the K is the highest power of the prime P that divides the size of G. And the theorem is that G is forced to have a subgroup of this size P to the K. So let's actually see why something like this would matter. So say you had a group G and its size was three squared times five squared times seven squared. Okay, so what this theorem says then is you have some subgroup of size three squared, which I'll call H1 and then another of size 5 squared, which is h2, and another of size 7 squared, which is h3. So the idea behind the Seal theorem is that if you want to figure out the structure of G, you now have at your disposal three subgroups of really large size that you know live inside of your group G. So in this case, because they're prime squared size, there's a theorem that tells us that these three groups happen to be abelian. Now, there may be many choices for these individual groups, but at least we know we can find them. And then the goal for finding out how G works is to figure out how these individual groups piece together. And in examples of actually using the CELO theorems in practice, that's the kind of thing that you do. You find these subgroups and then figure out how they piece together to figure out what the structure of G itself is. So let's go ahead and actually see how this proof starts out and where the proof for this thing comes from. So the proof is going to rely on looking at a particular group action on a particular set. The set, which we're going to call omega, consists of subsets of G of a particular size. They're ones of size P to the K. Right? So this P to the K right over here that we have in our information given. So this is not subgroups of size p to the k. We don't know yet whether there even is one. It's just subsets, period. And what we're going to do is construct an action on this particular subset, set of subsets. And that action is going to give to light a subgroup of the size that we want. So the action is going to be the following. So g acts on omega in the following way. So that means it this action has to take subsets of size p to the k and produce subsets of size p to the k. Now one thing that you do in group theory that takes elements inside of a group, like a set of them, and produces a set of the same size is to let the elements act on the original set by multiplication. So our action is going to do that. It's going to take this particular set x and act on it by multiplication. So we're going to produce a new set, which is gx, taking over all the elements x in our particular big set x. Okay, so because the map that sends elements in x to gx is bijective, its inverse is multiplication on the left by g inverse, this thing at the end will end up having the same size as the original set x. So since x has size p to the k, this thing on the right actually does have size p to the k. So it is in our set here. Okay, now we need to check all of the axioms to check this is actually a group action. But luckily, because we've constructed this by left multiplication by a group element, those things are actually quite manageable to um, realize. So I'm not going to prove them, but I'm going to just uh, leave that to you. But this is a group action. Okay, so we have a set and a group action. We're going to analyze this group action to hopefully find our subgroup of size p to the k. Okay, so now we have our set and our action that's given for every single g in our group. 
Let's analyze this for a bit. So first of all, let's look at the size of the actual set that we're acting on is. So this consists of all the subsets of a certain size. The number of elements in our entire group is p to the k. So the num p to the k times m. So the number of elements here is the number of elements in the group. Choose the number of elements we're choosing, which is p to the k. Okay, so one can prove combinatorially that this happens to be congruent to m modulo p. The point of this, though, is that m is co-prime with p. So what this means, then, is if we look at this action of g on omega, the action is going to split into orbits. And because the number of elements in omega is this thing right over here, one of the orbits is not going to have p as a factor in its size because this is the entire size of the set omega. Omega splits into a disjoint union of orbits. The sum of those orbit sizes has to be the size of this entire set, but that's not a factor of p. So we can say then that one of the orbits of this action of g on omega, let's call it O, has size not a multiple of p. Okay, so let's pick a particular set in this orbit. So the orbit of x, that's the entire group acting on x, the output has to be O itself because x is in the orbit. The way orbits work, you have an orbit. If you pick something in the orbit, the orbit of that is that entire orbit. Okay, um, interesting, but this orbit size doesn't have a factor of p in it. So if we look at the orbit stabilizer theorem, this actually tells us something about the stabilizer of this x. So the orbit stabilizer theorem says that the size of the stabilizer times the size of the orbit of x has to be the size of the group g itself, which is p to the k times m. Okay. But we're saying that this thing here, this is the size of this orbit, and the size of the orbit is not a multiple of p. So we can't have any of this factor right over here in here. That means that this piece has to have all of the p to the k inside of it. So we can say that p to the k divides the size of the stabilizer of this particular element we picked in the orbit. Okay, interesting. Now the stabilizer itself is a subgroup of G. It's the set of elements in the group G that under our action fix the set X itself. So here now we have a subgroup, the stabilizer of X, whose size divides this p to the k. What we're going to prove is in fact that the size of this stabilizer happens to be exactly p to the k. And consequently, this stabilizer, which is a sub subgroup of the group G, is a group of the size that we're interested in. Okay, so we're going to save some of this data here and go ahead and explore that. All right, so we found an element of this set, so it has size p to the k, so that its stabilizer under the action has p to the k as a factor. What we're going to prove is actually that the size of the stabilizer has to be less than or equal to p to the k for a completely other reason. And putting these two together, the conclusion becomes apparent because we have that the stabilizer has size less than or equal to p to the k, but p to the k divides its size. So these two together would tell you that this stabilizer size is exactly p to the k. And since the stabilizer itself is a subgroup of the group G, this implies the stabilizer is a subgroup of size p to the k, and so it's an example of the type of group that we're looking for. So where does this inequality come from? This can come from analyzing what stabilizers do themselves. 
So to prove that the size of the stabilizer is less than or equal to P to the K, which is the thing that we have left, what we're going to do is consider a random element in our particular set X. So just to remind ourselves of the framework, we have P to the K possible choices, so there's lots of choices, we're just going to pick one of them. And what we're going to do is consider the map that takes G to itself, where we take an element in the group and we map it to G times this A right over here. Now this thing here is a bijection. And the reason is because if we multiply by A inverse here, we'll come back to the group itself. So definitely a bijection. But what happens to elements in the stabilizer when we perform this? So if this thing is in the stabilizer of capital X, then that means when we hit it with an element of capital X, it stays in capital X. So if G is in the stabilizer, then this thing is in capital X. So the outputs of things from the stabilizer of capital X are things that are inside of capital X. But this thing is supposed to be a bijection. So that means that there's a bijection between the stabilizer of capital X and some subset of capital X itself. So this bijection on G allows us to show that the size of the stabilizer of X is actually less than or equal to the size of X itself. And the size of X itself is P to the K. So this thing has size less than or equal to P to the K. Great, so we put everything together. We do get indeed that the stabilizer is a subgroup of the size that we want.